Hey everyone, happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to the Matt Allen Show Thanksgiving recipe video series. Yes, this year, in addition to doing our annual Thanksgiving Day radio show, uh, where we talk about family traditions and recipes, I'm gonna actually do videos to show you how to make this stuff. People have been telling me for years, why don't you put it on YouTube so people can see it? Okay, I'm putting it on YouTube so people can see it. Now, the first one uh, that I wanted to show you is one that I've talked about a lot on the air and it's so hard to describe it. So I'm gonna show it to you, it's how to make sourdough bread. Now this isn't necessarily a family tradition like for a long time in my family, but I started it. So it's kind of gonna be my tradition going forward. Um, and what I did was a couple of years ago, I investigated and was fascinated by making bread. A lot of people have done this during the pandemic. They wanted to learn how to make sourdough bread. And so since everybody was home, they created these starters. Well, two or three years ago, uh, I think it's three years ago now, I made my own. And the starter is very interesting. It's a yeast colony. It's a colony of naturally occurring yeast that's in the air all around us as we speak. And you can trap it. You trap it in a slurry of water, equal parts water and flour. And you basically use that and keep it alive to raise your bread. You know, sometimes you can, you can buy commercial yeast and whatnot. Now, this is a little bit complex because you have to maintain a starter. I will give you link a, a link to a video of Alton Brown's Need Not Sourdough Bread. That's what he calls it, the Need Not Sourdough Bread. It's a very simple recipe, but it uses commercial yeast. I'll put it in the description. I'll put a link to the video in the description, so you can just go down there and you can click on it. And it'll be a, it's a similar process, but it's much easier for you to do because you don't have to create a starter. If you want to create a starter, I will also put a link to, for, for a video um, on how to do that and that way you can create your own starter. Just give yourself two weeks at least to build the starter up. Mine sits in a jar in the refrigerator. This is my starter. And it literally, you know, like yesterday I knew I was gonna be making bread today, so I put equal parts flour and water in here to get it ready to go. And uh, so I'll be making bread with you, but this is where it sits in my fridge. This is the starter. It lives there all the time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, besides the starter, I'm gonna give you the rundown of all the ingredients and the equipment you're gonna to need to do this if you wanna tackle it, okay? And a lot of the stuff I've accumulated over the years because I like to do it. Um, you don't have to have all this equipment. You probably have a lot of it in your house already. I just have some you know, fancier stuff. I say fancy, it's not really not that fancy. It's just meant for bread baking rather than you can just use uh, other things. I'll, I'll explain to you as we go. Um, so let me start off with all the equipment and the ingredients first, and then I'll show you the process, all right? So this is gonna be kind of fun, hopefully. I hope you enjoy it. First piece of equipment, obviously, bowls. I use these metal bowls because they're light, they're easy. This is a smaller one we're gonna use uh, for, the, for salt and for water. To add in later on, this is the big one we use for the to, to do the, the, the flour and the water. The most important piece of equipment, honestly, when you're baking anything, because you need to use weight rather than cups or with you know with tablespoons and stuff, is a scale. I, I really don't know any other way. This is probably the most, you know, the thing you probably have to invest in is a food scale. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it. You may have one, because a lot of people do it for diets and stuff like that but I use this food scale right here. It's digital, um, you know, it's part of my, my eating program my wife and I use. We use this constantly. This is an OXO, I love OXO, everything. But this is crucial because I do everything in the metric system. When I do my bread, I, you know, I measure in grams. And so this, if you don't have a food scale, that's one thing you have to get. In this recipe that I have, I use two different types of flour. One, you can pick whatever brand you want. This is the brand I use. Bread flour, you gotta have bread flour. Bread flour has a higher protein content, It is, uh, for, which is good for gluten, which is good for bread. So bread flour is a must. Um, if people try it with all-purpose all flour, maybe it will work for you. You can try it if you want to, you feel like experimenting. I always use bread flour. I also buy and have a little bit of wheat flour for taste. It gives a little depth of flavor, supposedly. I don't know, you don't have to, just use all the white flour if you want to. You can mix it up. I would recommend you start with white flour though, uh, and don't try to make too much whole wheat bread. Whole wheat bread's really hard to, to develop gluten, and it's, it's, you wanna make this as easy as possible. Okay, so you have the flours, right? Two different types of flours, one type, whatever you want. Then you're gonna have your bowls. Then you, I have this little thing, I call, it's called a dough whisk. I think the, 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 I wanna say this is Danish, I don't know, but this is a dough whisk. You can use a spoon. You put it in the bowl, this is what you use to mix up the, the flour and the water. Use a spoon if you want to. You don't need this thing. 
I, 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 I got a problem with Amazon. I'm an, I'm an addict. I order things. This is what you need. Okay. Um, the other thing you're going to need too, proofing baskets. I ordered these. You know what these are? They're bowls with cloth on them. You can get a bowl with a with a uh, with a towel, you know, a tea towel or a dish towel. Put it in a bowl. You're fine. The only thing you'll have to do though is you'll have to dust it with. I highly recommend. I know I had it here somewhere. I guess I lost it. Um, rice, white rice, white flour, white rice flour, white rice flour. You need that. It's really good at keeping things from getting too flourish. You put too much flour in dough, it gets dried out and stuff like that. It's not good. Um, but if you use white, white, white rice flour, or rice flour in general, it helps it from sticking to counters and you can, you have to dust these proofing baskets with it. So that's the other type of flour you need. I also have a, I think it's pronounced lam or lame, lam. This is to score the bread. So all this is is a razor blade and a fancy handle and you slice the bread so that it can expand properly in the oven. You can use a knife, just get a sharp knife or you can use an X-Acto knife or a razor blade, whatever you got. Um, the big thing I would say that if you needed to purchase anything or you probably might have it is a Dutch oven. The secret to this bread, and I believe it's called a tartine style country loaf that we're gonna make. The secret to this is that you need to have steam to raise bread to get what they call oven spring where the you know it's a enclosed environment with steam it allows the bread to expand and create a nice crust on the outside and most commercial ovens have steam built into them yours probably does not unless it does maybe you have a fancy oven uh, mine doesn't so what you do is you bake it in a vessel and the vessel is a cast iron in my case cast iron dutch oven and you put it in the oven and you heat it up in there till it's a ripping hot 500 degrees and it steams itself inside these vessels. You can find fancy, I have one, uh, fancy bread baking vessels in the actual, you know, on Amazon or wherever you want to go. You, you don't have to. These Dutch ovens are fantastic. You can cook stews in them. You can bake chicken in them. You can do a thousand different things with a Dutch oven. Or if you have a cast iron Dutch oven, this is enamel and cast iron, use one of those. Um, it's fantastic. And that's pretty much, oh, the other thing is a bench scraper. Um, I forgot to take it out of the drawer. A bench scraper, you've probably seen those. They're just a, a metal little you know, thing to scrape up dough. It's helpful because you can cut the dough later on. Um, but that's about it, that's all you need. And you probably have most of this stuff, if not all of it, um, besides the dough whisk, which is weird, uh, in your kitchen. So what we're gonna do now is I will show you how we put it together. It's very simple. All you need is time. And honestly, you need a couple of hours of, of time to be around to fold the dough and to let it proof, you can let it proof as long as overnight to a couple of hours. The other thing that's interesting too is that a lot of this has to do uh, with successful bread is, uh, is temperature in your house. A warmer day is better than a colder day, but you can finagle that too. You can put it in your oven with the light on to keep it warm, stuff like that. I'll explain as we go, but um, I'm looking forward to it. So I will now show you how to make the bread. So here we go. All right. The first thing we do to do the sourdough bread is to obviously put together the two different types of flour that I use for the recipe. So for this recipe, you're gonna need 900 grams by weight of bread white, white bread flour. So first, that's what we do here. We have the white bread flour. I'm gonna pour this in, 900 grams. We'll get the grams in here. Here it is. Just pour it in, nothing big. You know, these, it's very often these things will sometimes be a little bit in, you know, non-exact. If you get like 905 grams, it's not the worst thing in the world. So, but try to be as accurate as possible, especially with the dry stuff, because you can just take it out with a, with a spoon and you don't have to worry about that. So let's see, 900 grams. Oh, see, I just went over a little bit myself. I went 913, 930. So what I do is I grab a little spoon and you, know, you look at the digital scale. That's why it's so important to have the digital scale and then you can just go ahead and take out what you need. And that'll be about, close enough, 900 grams, 901. And then I do 100 grams of the whole wheat flour. Again, any brand you want. This gives it a little bit of a nuttiness, I guess, and it, it gives you a little bit of depth of flavor, so it's not just all white flour, like sugary goodness, even though what's wrong with that, right? Uh, 100 grams of this, let's see here. 60, 75, 80, 92, and 100. Okay, 100 grams of this. And then what I do is I just take my dough whisk and I just mix it up. Just mix it in there, very simple, very easy. 
Simple, easy, is a beautiful thing. All right, so now we're gonna do our wet ingredients. And the wet ingredients are basically just the water uh, for the actual dough and the starter mixed together. So what we do is you put your new bowl on there, you zero it out, and then you grab your water. In this case, the recipe, you need 700 grams. I say warm water, like you want it like 90 to 100 degrees. You just, I get it out of the tap, I just feel it. It's not really that big of a deal. By the time you pour it in, it will be cooled off from the bowl, from the air, all that stuff. So you wanna put 700 grams in this bowl. This is, by the way, a 75% hydration dough, which means by the total weight of the dough, the percentage of water will be 75%. So it's easy with 1,000 grams of, of uh, dough. Oh, excuse me, 1,000 grams of flour, you're gonna have 750 at the end of it of water. Um, so in this case, you want 700 grams, put a little bit too much in there, so we take a little bit out with a little spoon. That's about right where you need it. Um, 700 grams, and then you get 200 grams of your starter. Again, the starter is something that you can make on your own, but for me, I always have it because I'm ready for this stuff. So put another 200 grams of this. You see how it's floating? That's very important. That's when you know it's ready to go because it's got all the beautiful bubbles in there from really what it is is yeast byproduct it's gas from the yeast the yeast eats the dough eats the carbohydrates eats the proteins in the dough and then emits a gas which is what makes all the lovely bubbles in your bread and that's why it can float if you have a starter that doesn't float it's not ready to raise bread so we then take this and i mix this all together it's going to be a cloudy mess and all those little yeasties are in a nice warm bath and they're very happy I don't want to mute it. I want it to be singing in it. Okay. If you can hear my producer niece who is telling me that I'm doing stupid things, that's fine. All right. So, by the way, when you make the starter, the smells that are coming off this thing are amazing. It smells like wine. It smells like alcohol because that's all the beautiful flavor you're going to get from the natural sourdough, which you can't get from commercial yeast. You can only get it from a sourdough. Uh, culture. That's kind of the fun of it. All right, so you take this, all right? So I'm going to take the scale out of the way, put this over here, and then I'm going to bring back my dough, my flour. So how are we doing with that, director? Is that a good shot there? Can everybody see the thing properly? That is perfect. You're happy with that? Okay. Yes. Then we take the water and we just dump it in and you add one to the other. Now my bowls should be probably bigger than this, but I just torture myself with it all the time. And then this is where you have the dough whisk. Now, technically, you could do this by hand if you want. You want to stick your hand in there and just whoosh it around? Go right ahead. But this is, call, is going to be what's called the autolease. The autolease is, um, is a time where a dough sits in order to hydrate, in order to, for, the, for the dough to absorb all the water from a recipe. And the autolease is going to last about an hour. Then I'm going to add a, another 50 grams of water with 20 grams of salt dissolved in it. Salt inhibits yeast. So, you know, you don't want to put too much, but you need salt for the bread to taste good. But it does inhibit yeast a little bit. If I left this, it's one of the, you know, sometimes it's happened where I made loaves of bread and I've forgotten to put the salt in it. Um, you can tell because when you come back, the stuff is really, the yeast is going crazy and the bread is really super high and everything. You're like, oh no, I forgot the salt. And if you've ever had a cracker with no salt in it or anything, it's just dead. It tastes like garbage. You need the salt. So anyway, you keep going with this and you can see it's pretty much all incorporated. And what you do is you cover this. Now you want to have like a, a cloth towel of some kind, tea towel, or I have a proofing cloth. You cover this, you let it sit for half an hour or maybe an hour if you need more time. It'll poof up a little bit. Then we're going to dump another 50 grams of water and mix with, like I said, 20 grams of salt and we'll squish it. And I'll show you what that looks like. And we'll squish it all in there and then we'll begin the fold. And I'll show you as we go. And this is going to be three hours, right? So you're going to fold it a total of six times. Then we're going to take it out and we're going to show you how to shape it and get it ready for the for the final proofing and then we'll bake it and you'll get to see it before uh my family gets to eat it all right so that's the first part this is going to begin the autolease all right so it's been 
about half an hour and the auto lease time is now up. This is what the dough looks like right here after the auto lease. If you remind, remember, the auto lease is the time where the dough soaks up all the water that we put in there. You'll see it looks like it's expanded a little bit, it's risen a little bit from the uh, sloppy mess it was a few minutes ago. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to add in 50 grams of water and 20 grams of salt mixed together to squish in here. So let me move this out of the way real quick. I have my digital scale as you see. And we're going to put another bowl here. And we're going to measure out 20 grams of salt. I use this stuff. Sea salt is good, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. All right, there we go, pour it in, and I'm watching. It looks like a lot of salt, folks, it's not. This, by the way, this, this batch makes two loaves of bread. You need this salt, otherwise it doesn't taste good. All right, so that's about 20, 22 grams of salt. In my case, put 50 grams of water in here. And this will go into the dough and will be used to you know fill out the hydration of the dough so we swish this around we get this dissolved and we'll take out the scale we'll move this out of the way and then we will keep swishing this around here we go and then i take the dough and i literally quite literally just dump it in ready swish it around swish it around as much as you can dissolve it and then just dump this on and this is kind of the fun squishy gross part ready you just do this and you and it incorporates itself. It's one of my favorite things to do in the kitchen is to sing like Bugs Bunny. You get a little insane when you make bread because who's going to go through all this aggravation when you can go to a store and buy it, right? Um, all right, so we get this squishy. This does not have to look pretty. But you see how it's smoothing out a little bit like this? It's getting a little elastic. You see that? But you want this to be really elastic. You want the gluten to be developed. So what you do is you kind of just make it so that this is all incorporated. And then this is going to begin the folds. Again, this is like I said before, this is a tartine um, method. There's like 800 different ways to do your dough. But I like this one because it's simple. You literally let this sit. You cover this, let it sit. And then you'll eventually do a, what they call a stretch and a fold. And this will... Um, become more elastic more poofy and everything else so you want to put this in a warm place you know what i do i put the oven light on in my oven cover it with a cloth and then put it inside the oven so it's got a constant temperature in case it's cold in your house and all that jazz so this will sit and in 30 minutes we'll come back and we'll fold it in every 30 minutes for three hours so every 30 minutes set a timer come down and we'll go have a drink watch some tv drink a cup of coffee whatever you're doing and then we'll show you the folds and we'll time lapse it real quick i'll just show you the, i'll show you one fold you can repeat it and then I'll show you what the end product looks like. Now, we're going to do this one time, and you want to do this every 30 minutes for a total of three hours. So you're going to do six folds. So just do the same thing that I do right now six times, okay? Um, the one thing you want to do is you want to wet your hand for this. This is, sounds weird, but you've got to make sure your hand is wet. Otherwise, the dough will in, irreparably stick to it. It's, it's a nightmare. It, it'll, it'll be a disaster. So let me give you a little bit of a reveal here. See this? Oh, look at that. Oh, very nice, huh? All right, so what you do with the folds are basically very simple. You take a wet hand and you go underneath it. You scoop it up the edge. You grab it. You stretch it and you fold it in the middle. Let it go. Turn the bowl. Next side. It's very easy. It's little corners, right? So you fold it, put it down like that. See the little corner right here? You grab this, fold it like this, fold it over, spin the bowl, and then you do it again until it's all been folded over. You can do it three, four times. I mean, sorry, four times, five times, whatever you want to do. So again, every 30 minutes, go right ahead, do the same thing again, fold it up again until you get a good three hours, and then I'll show you what we do at the end of three hours. All right, so this is the final product after the three hours of folding. As you can see, it's billowy. You've got a couple of the, the bubbles there for the gas bubbles. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a, we're going to turn this out onto the counter and then we're going to do a pre-shape. So what we do is we take this out of the way and we douse the counter with the white rice flour, right? Told you about this. So you do this, sprinkle it liberally. Okay. Put it all around and then you're going to use a bench one of the types of bench scrapers this is also a, a dough scraper that i use 
this is great. You can buy these a cheap piece of plastic, no big deal, right? So you hold it out like this. Oops, sorry, I bashed the camera there. Let me scrape it out of the bowl. Be careful when you're handling this dough. You don't want to uh, mess with it too much because you don't want to what they call degas it, which means take all the gas that's been built up with a beautiful yeast and push it all out of there. So you leave it like this. And what you try to do now at this point is to cut it into an e two equal pieces because I told you it's going to be a, a two loaves. So you cut it, probably eyeball it, and you can look at it later on, and try and separate it. It's real sticky. It's tough to do. So if you look at it and you see that the pieces look a little bit uneven, it's fine. Just cut a piece off and stick it back on the other side. All right? And so what you did there is you know, notice you have all this white rice flour that's on underneath it. I'd actually do a little bit more here. All right. And then you fold this over once. So now the floured side is on, on top and bottom. And then you fold this over once. You can always use more rice flour if you want to. And then what I do is I use the stickiness of the dough and the, um, and the bench itself and the counter itself to actually pre-shape it. So you kind of drag it against the actual counter. And as I'm doing this, what I'm doing is, I don't know if you can see my hands or not, you're scooping it under like this and you're almost like rolling it under itself. So you're kind of doing like a, like you're turning a car, you're going like this. So as you turn it, you're kind of rolling it like that and folding it under itself, right? So you're doing this like that. And it's a pre-shape. I'm gonna. We're gonna fold it actually and do a much better shaping later on. But you can, or you can just do it this way. You pull it like this, and it pulls against the counter. And what it does, is it folds under itself and creates a nice tight skin. So you get like a little bit of a, a ball of dough here, right? And you can spin it this way. You can do it whatever you want to. That's one of them. So it's kind of like a pre-shape, and it'll spread now. And then I'll do it here the same thing. Okay. So now you have both of them that are like this. And what you do is you can sprinkle a little bit of flour on them if you want to. to get so Because they're kind of tacky today. So I take the rice flour and I just sprinkle it on top. Spread it around. And then you want this to sit for like half an hour like this. All right? Take a half an hour. Let it. This is called a bench rest. Just let it sit for half an hour. And when we come back for another, in another half hour, I will show you how to do the final shaping. And that goes into the proofing basket. And then uh, I'll tell you what happens after that. All right, so these have bench rested now. They're sitting here. I'm gonna do one of these to show you. Well, maybe I can do two, but there's two here. It's hard to keep them all in the frame. So let me just show you what I do with these just to do the final proofing. Um, I just need my proofing baskets. You remember I showed you those? The proofing baskets are they're just wicker baskets. You can use a bowl with a, with a, with a towel in them. This is what these are here. Whoop. Let's make sure I get this right. So these are proofing baskets. You know, I'll put them to the side. This is what's going to end up. What we're going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to shape this bread and I'm going to put it in the refrigerator. You don't have to do it this way if you don't want to, but I'm putting it in the refrigerator overnight. It helps it develop more flavor. The cold actually uh, retards the um, yeast from going too far and overproofing. Um, you could just leave it in these proofing baskets for another two to three hours, a little late at night where we're taping this right now. So I'm not going to bother with it tonight. going to cook it tonight. Um, so I'm going to let it sit in the in the refrigerator overnight, covered in plastic in these in these proofing baskets. And then tomorrow, bake it tomorrow. And I'll show you what the baking looks like and everything. But let me show you how to how to fold this. There's like a thousand different ways to fold the dough. This is the way I know how to do it. So I'll do I'll do two of these for everybody. See so what you do is you first you gotta get this stuff. See so how it kind of touch there? You wanna separate that as much as possible, not make a mess. And then what you do is you sprinkle a little bit more flour on these. This is again rice flour, just so you don't get them stuck on each other and we do something to this effect you, you, you scrape it off the bench you take it and you flip it over okay same thing here yeah. flip it over okay is this the best one director to use in the shot there yes it is okay good so what you do is you want to pull it out a little bit again don't keep don't degas these degas you want to push on it that's not good because there's lots of nice beautiful bubbles in here you don't want to touch so what you do is you take this the bottom part here first and you fold it up and you do like a little bit of a little fold like this then you take one side you flip it over 
you take the other side and you flip it over and then you can take these two points here and fold it down like this now there's a little thing called stitching where you grab let me make this down here you grab just grab the side and you literally like you're stitching it together take a piece and this is giving the dough structure evidently this is what they, the experts say it gives it uh, a little bit of body to it it gives you it puts the the gluten webs into an order so that when it bakes up it has a structure to it, it has all this thing you roll this up and then you basically have this nice little packet and you can do all kinds of things you can i like to use my bench scraper and do this remember that remember the the tight skin we had before just do that you can do the car thing again if you'd like to you want to try and make this as round as possible see you just pull it and it's sticking against the counter a little bit and folding under itself, making a tight little ball. And it's got a nice little roundness to it. It's nice and firm. And then you're gonna put this in the proofing basket. See, put the proofing basket here, grab this and you flip it upside down in the proofing. Now my proofing baskets have been used many times and they have a nice little skin of um, stuff on there from many, many, <laughs> many uses. So this won't stick. If you've got brand new ones, you really gotta rub the flour in there and make sure that the uh, flour is coated the inside, otherwise it'll stick to the, to the actual linen. You don't want that. So if you're gonna use a paper, if, excuse me, if you're gonna use a, um, a dish towel, you make sure when you put the dish towel over the bowl that you sprinkle a ton of the flour on it because otherwise it will stick and you don't wanna have that. So this is gonna go in a plastic bag and be in the refrigerator it can be up to 24 hours if you want to but i usually do it about 12 hours so tomorrow morning i'll cook this probably seven eight o'clock tomorrow morning good to go and these are going go in the fridge like i said uh cover it in plastic put them in a plastic bag you got a shopping bag or something like that whatever kind of plastic you can put over them and put them in the fridge and then tomorrow morning which you'll be the next thing you see we'll bake them off and you'll see the final product all right so it's the next day we've as you see new shirt um so we put the dough in the refrigerator to proof overnight it's been in these proofing baskets and you can see it's proofed up and it's uh it's ready to go that's kind of what it looks like so what i usually do if you'll come down here and see i cut out some pieces of parchment paper this is a safety thing because what i've done already and what's happening right now is my oven is at 500 degrees right now and my baking vessels the dutch oven that we showed you in the beginning has been in there the entire time put it in the cold oven and just start it up and everything comes to like 500 degrees so you want it ripping hot because that's what's going to get the good oven spring and the good oven rise so what i'll show you next is i'm going to put these doughs out on the parchment paper and score them so you have a nice ear on the dough and ear is a little piece of crust that sticks up because the way you score it i'll show you that right now then we'll put it in the oven and we'll show you what it looks like throughout the process all right so what you do is um you're going to turn this out it's very simple it's a good thing about it, having it proof in the fridge is that it'll be kind of stiff so it's not going to you know plop all over the place but what you do is you gently roll this out just so you can see it and you put it on the parchment paper like that okay and you get it you can move it center it whatever way you want and then you take your lame or your razor blade, sharp knife, whatever you want to use. And what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to tilt it to the side like this. There's a little angle and you're going to slice it one complete slice right across in like a half moon shape. And you want like a little flap of dough sticking up like this because when it bakes, it's going to curl up like this and it's going to create that, that ear it's called. And so it's kind of pretty. So I'm going to do it like this real quick swipe. You see? And if you feel like you didn't get it deep enough the first time, you can go back through. See it? And you can see some of the bubbles in there. It's kind of neat looking. Now that will bake up and it will turn up. So what I'm going to do is quickly go and get the hot, hot vessel and put it inside the vessel. Watch your hands. Use your mitts. Don't, you don't want to burn anything. I'll show you that next. All right, so this part is really dangerous because this stuff is ripping hot. You want to be very, very careful. These pots are probably about 500 degrees. Okay, so you go ahead, you take the lid off, and then you gently lift and be careful. You put the dough with the parchment paper in the Dutch oven. Then you remember to use your pot holders. You 
there you go yeah and then put it right on top and then back in the oven this is going to bake and you want to lower the temperature now when you put it back in there to 450 degrees and this is going to bake in the oven at 450 for one half hour 30 minutes uh, after the half hour is over we'll show you what it looks like right, it's been 30 minutes now this is the first part of the bake it's going to be a little blonde it's going to be real light you want to cook this now see you look at the reveal you see how it's come up it's sprung up look at that ear oh it looks good uh, now you want to rotate it around so that everything gets cooked evenly and then you want to put it back in the oven for another 15 minutes that's going to brown it you want it almost verging on burnt look at that ear isn't that beautiful you want it almost verging on burnt people like it but you you determine your level of darkness whatever however darkness you want and we'll show it to you when it's done all right so we set this shot up specifically to create drama because this is the part where you actually see the final bread like i said you can make this as dark as you want to some people like lighter bread they don't like the little uh you know the little acidic char flavor to bread but this is the end and this is the, the part after all the hard work you did you get to see the final product now, by the way the house during this whole process smells like heaven baking bread is like uh it's probably one of the greatest smells on the earth so um enjoy this part of it as you open up the door you're going to see what it looks like now if it's too blonde let it go a little longer but watch it because you don't want to burn this after all this work and there you are i like this color this looks good to me um the bottom might be a little bit more charred than the top I and mean, you can also see the ear see the ear on the top of that look at that that is beautiful and you can see the bubbles from the uh, from the the steam that's it's released. That that distance in that little split there that's called oven rise. Um, this is probably one of the best oven rises I've ever gotten in any loaf. Um, and so you know it's fascinating to watch. The smells are incredible. Uh, all right now when you take it out of the pot, just be careful. Use the corners of the parchment paper. That's why I use it. It's like a sling. And one of the things you want to do, and see if we can get the sound clip for you here, is you tap the bottom of the loaf. If you hear a hollow sound, it sounds like a hollow wall, then you know it's really good. Now, you cannot eat this right now. Let me say, let me, let me rephrase that. You can. The best thing to do is to let it sit there for a while, for at least two hours, because things are still happening inside the bread. Things are congealing. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're forming a matrix of carbohydrates and whatnot. But just be careful. If you want to go ahead and eat the warm bread, go ahead. I'm not going to bust your chops. I'm just saying it's best to let it cool. All right, so the final product, this is it. This is the big reveal. This is what everybody wants to see. It's called the crumb, which is like the bubbles and stuff inside the actual bread itself. So what we do, you need a serrated knife, a cutting board, and let's slice into this sucker and see how we did. You can hear the crustiness. You hear that? The smells are incredible. You can smell the sourdough. Like you don't have this you can smell the distinctness between regular bread and sourdough bread. And the bottom, because it was so crusty, is hard to cut through. You gotta cut a couple of times without destroying it. All right, here we go. The big reveal. You ready? There you go. Look at that. All the beautiful little bubbles, all the gloriousness. You'll notice like a little shine on the inside of the bubbles. That little shine is uh, starch granules that have just caramelized, basically. And that's that beautiful. Now you do is a little smell. You'll smell the the sourness of it. It smells like vinegar almost. It's just uh, it's good stuff. So there's your sourdough bread. Put this out for your Thanksgiving dinner, and everybody will love you forever. See, I'm me, so I have to buy people off with food as much as possible. Because who wants to hang out with me? Nobody. Bring bread. Everybody wants to hang out with you. All right. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Stay tuned for more videos and more of our family recipes. I hope you have a great day.